So hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Ambassadors. Um, we have a little guest with us today. Um, so first we'll just introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Vineet, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm Lo, and my pronouns are they, she. Uh, we're joined today by another amazing guest in our series uh, documenting by history and activism. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Bren, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I run the BIPAN Library, which is an online and in-person uh, bi library and online directory of bi media. And we can kind of see it behind you. That's that's so exciting. It looks amazing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just, I run it out of my house. So this is my living room. Um, and it's really a joy to live with. <laughs> yeah, tell us more about what it's like to live in your own like queer archive and library? It really keeps me reading from the library, which is nice because when I first, when I first was coming out to myself, like the safe way for me to explore um, my identity was through literature. Like you don't have to come out to anybody to do that. You don't have to, I'm disabled. So I didn't have to try to navigate inaccessible queer spaces. Like I could just read. Um, and so this keeps me reading, like, um, especially the nonfiction, like I'm reading queer history, queer theory by uh, like personal essays regularly. And um, it keeps me thinking, like it keeps my brain active. I enjoy it. <laughs> what started all of this? Um, well, it is, it is connected to coming out for me. Um, when before I'd come out to anybody, I was just out to myself. I visited a library, a gay library, um, and I tried to like. I was there to support a friend who was out as queer, um, but I like tried to sneak over to find the pie books, um, and they only had around six, um, maybe fewer, um, and they were all very outdated. And several of them were critical of bisexuality, like, like it's a debate, um, and that was kind of a shock. Um, and very disruptive to my process, like deciding whether I was um, real or not. <laughs> um, but I also have this really stubborn sort of obsessive streak to my personality. Um, so I started researching. I was like, this can't be all there is. Surely th this is not all there is. Um, and I was right. The more I researched, I started a spreadsheet. Like I was, um, I read every single listicle on the internet with different titles of bi nonfiction, especially, and like some bi fiction. And I started cataloging it all just for myself. So I could open a spreadsheet, look at this list of books that um, reflected my experience. And I could feel like I was a real person that people had come before and people would come after and people understood. Um, and then eventually after a few years of starting to collect books on my own, just for myself to have, um, I started thinking like, this could help other people. It's helped me so much. Um, how can I make it public? Um, and I had this vision, I still have this vision of eventually taking them to either as like a pop-up event or as part of a larger archive and being able to have a room that like a bi or pan person could walk into and be surrounded by their history acknowledgement that like the people like you exist and did exist and will exist. Um, and that's like, that's my goal eventually. I really wanna have a space that people can come into and have that experience that's been so affirming for me. I'm imagining walking into a room that's just like wool to wool buy books and that feeling is like, whoa. <laughs> it's really emotional, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I don't know about you, Vinique, because obviously you're still writing your book. I Mine's going to print. It might be in print right now. I don't know. Um, but an experience I had whilst writing was that, um, and I wrote about this as like the opening of my introduction, is that I would go to bookshops near me, near my office or wherever I was, and I would go to the LGBT section and look for buy books and I did this every couple of days for about a year and I only came across two in that entire time. Um, 
and even the books that like mentioned bisexuality like you said were either critical or it was mentioned in passing um so it's still really hard to find bi literature yeah I mean I I found um I can't I can't say I ever had that moment where I like specifically went around looking but I I I became aware of it when you know, I was published in an anthology, which actually is in the background of Bree's library, and actually is in the background of mine at the same time, which is quite funny. Um, and I didn't realise just how little of there was until that moment where I was like, oh, this actually isn't a thing I've really seen before. And then I, then I actually went and looked and was like, and this actually, this doesn't exist? How does this, how is an indie press doing this? And it's never been done by the mainstream. There's no publisher who's decided we're going to collect a bunch of personal essays from bisexual people, only bisexual people, and involve them. And it just became like, and then you start looking at some general LGBTQ plus books, and you're like, wow, they just don't really mention bisexuality. And when they say LGBTQ plus, I mean, LG, like like most things, right? It just it just mumbles off after the G. Um, but yeah, I, I never realized just how how rare it was to find something like this. And then when when I looked at LGBTQ plus in general, it was it's just as we see with most LGBTQ plus faces or media, it's always focused around L and G. Um, so yeah, that really opened my eyes to like, wow, this is actually kind of a big moment. So um, you know, I mean, bisexual books do exist. I think the background behind Bren shows that, um, but enough of it isn't out there. Um, did you find when you were collecting books, did you find it was really hard to find some of the stuff? Yes, <laughs> uh, there's there's like a subset of. I mean, I'll take like the nonfiction section. This is all by nonfiction right here. Wow. Um, and easily half or more of it is out of print. Um, so to find that, I literally do things like I will sit down for two hours while I'm watching like Netflix with my partner and I will search bisexual or pansexual or something in like Goodreads and I will go through all 500 pages and just make sure there's nothing I've missed. Or I will go on a used bookstore site and search keywords. Um, and that's what's found me lots of rarer stuff that is literally not anywhere. There's a book, shoot, it's on the other side of the room. <laughs> um, uh, there's a book called Bisexual Horizons that was published by the Off Pink Collective in the UK. I don't know if you know anything about yeah. that group, but it's very out of print. They put out two books, Bisexual Lives and Bisexual Horizons. Bisexual Lives, I just purchased the only one that's available online anywhere. Like I've, I have looked high and low and I just purchased the last one that's available for sale anywhere at the moment. And Bisexual Horizons is similarly um, hard to find. Um, I've had books where the only way I could find them was searching the ISBN because there's no images of it online anywhere. There's like two mentions of it on a website somewhere, but no image. I have to just trust that the seller has put in the ISBN correctly and then see what shows up. Um, it can be pretty difficult to find some of them. Yeah. I actually have a copy of Bisexual Lives that uh, another bi activist, Pip Williams, lent to me when I started writing my book as a resource, and I've never given it back to them. <laughs> So it's, uh, <laughs> it's very rare. <laughs> um, maybe I'll send that back up to them and I won't uh, steal their rare buy book. <laughs> Just photocopy all of it before. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit more about how the band pipe and library functions. How do you help people? How do you get books to people? How do people, how does your content get out? Sure. So I released the website in the middle of COVID. So um, there is, I'm, I don't do a lot of in-person lending. Um, I do with friends and people locally that I know, um, but there's not a super strong buy community in my area. We do have a couple groups. They're very small. Um, 
and one of them has some issues as far as trans uh, topics. So I don't associate with them. Mm -hmm. So I focus largely on the online services. So um, every single book that I have on this bookshelf back here is listed on the website at bypamlibrary.com. Um, I have it organized, the catalog organized by genre and age group. Um, and then uh, I'm working on rolling out pages for all of the nonfiction books that has all the publisher information, all the book description, as well as the table of contents so that researchers can look through and see like which books will be useful to them for whatever topic they're researching, whether it's like bisexuality and AIDS or like pansexuality and the evolution of uh, that term, things like that. Um, and then also I'm adding bibliographies. So any books that are referenced in a, a given nonfiction title um, that would be useful to someone researching queer issues, I'm listing those so they know, because that gives you additional like insight into what this book is going to cover if you can tell all these other like spider webby books that's going to be touching and what's super fun about it at this point is that I own most of the books that are referenced in each other <laughs> so like I can put together like a like a graph of of what books reference each other and which is just the I'm a nerd it's a lot of fun um so I have a page on the site called library services um, and some of the things I offer, I don't offer book recommendations. I feel like that's important to say. Um, I'm not a recommendation service. I am um, like a research assistant, basically. I, if somebody emails me, I, had, I was helping someone with their dissertation a week or two ago, um, looking up references for Virginia Woolf. So I, I, will, I will term search in uh, the indexes for you. I will copy chapters for you, especially of out of print books or really difficult to find books, um, help people find citations for things. Um, yeah. And occasionally do like interviews or comment on things for uh, journalists. So we've talked about a bit about um, tracking them down, but where have you found them? So for me, I like eBay, one of my, because I'm also a bit of a book nerd and I love mm. old buy books as well. Um, like this time last year when I was doing writing and researching, I was like properly poaching all of the buy books off eBay, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. like bidding wars over books that are actually only about five pounds. Um, yep. So what has the process of like tracking down these books been like? Um, I frequent, I've got a couple of favorite sites that search multiple different used bookstores because I do buy the majority of them used. If a new book is coming out, I purchase it absolutely to support the author. I'm going to buy both of you. I've already, uh, I've already pre-ordered yours low, but, <laughs> um, I will purchase both of yours. Um, uh, because I, you want to stimulate the publishing industry, be like, Hey, these, this is content that we want. Um, but I, everything else I purchased used because I fund the library myself. I very occasionally get small donations, but it's, it's me being like, this is the part of my paycheck that goes towards this little obsession. So yeah, cross-referencing different used bookstores. There's a site called bookfinder.com that's great because it'll cross-reference a ton of different used bookstores. Um, and then, yeah, and I try not to support Amazon as much as possible as much as possible. <laughs> um, but people can yeah. donate to the Bypan Library, right? You have a, a donation link and you have some merch as well that people can... Um, can uh, yeah, that is that is true. Um, I have uh, at bypanlibrary.com slash support. It lists like the various different ways you can support the library. Um, eventually we're gonna open up a PO box so that people can actually donate materials if they like. Um, but we don't have that yet because I haven't been able to open it because of COVID. But yeah, I have a tea public shop where you can get shirts and mugs and pins, pins, which are pretty cheap and really cute. I think there's one with the logo. There's a buy pan solidarity pin, which I wish I, I wish I had nearby to show off, but, um, yeah, there's, there's ways to support the library. And then we also have a Kofi if you just want to give a few bucks. Um, we'll and that in that description. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, all, all donations go directly into either acquiring material or um, helping with my website costs um, or like little office supplies or like archival supplies. So boxes, protective, like all my 
magazines are in protective sleeves like those things cost money and um okay after a while it stacks up so that's what all donations go towards i don't pay myself for any of this <laughs> so we mentioned nonfiction. i wanted to ask about your fiction section have you found a lot of buy and buy in fiction and how, what has the content been like? Do you find a lot of problematic by stuff in fiction? Has it been interesting reads? Um, it's such a complicated question, um, but it's a great one. I Fiction is harder to find for adults. Like, buy and pan fiction, very difficult to find, especially fiction that names it. There's plenty of literature, and I do collect this, literature that doesn't use any sort of label or doesn't even say fluid, but the behavior is there and the, the, it's clearly an intent to like portray by or pan, you know, M-spec attraction in the book, but they don't want to name it. They don't want to put it on the book cover, like the back flap. We're never going to tell anyone that's in this. <laughs> so I get, I find fiction through reviews. I have to literally one of my other hobbies that like while I'm watching Netflix on the couch I'm going on Goodreads and I'm term searching and reviews of books that I get a feeling might be by there's <laughs> nothing there's nothing on the surface that would tell me that genuinely I'm just like well I'll, I'll go find out because buy and pay and people on the internet have each other's backs and if there is this content in a book they'll say it in the review so we're all kind of looking out for each other and I'm benefiting greatly from people who just give their personal opinion online and sometimes I get to, uh, tipped off about a book from um, a gay man who really hates that one of the main characters in this romance book was bi instead of gay. <laughs> so thank you to them as well. <laughs> and what about, um, so I know when I've been looking for bi books, I mean, if you type into Amazon, like bi book, a lot of it is smut and erotica. Um, so is that something you're also archiving? Yes. I don't, um, I do not focus on it because there's so much. Um, it's, it's like a <laughs> focusing on it will be something I do, just not really soon. Um, but also because I don't have, I'm not personally loaning it out and it's not stuff that I read a ton. Um, I do a little, not a ton. Um, so because I put it like a little bit on the back burner because it won't be useful to me immediately. And it's also not something that generally speaking, people are going to want me to reference for them. So um, it's not a priority, but I do have romance novels. I do have some erotica novels. Um, and I'm very, very open to having it in the future. Because the thing about representation that you were just talking about a, a minute ago, Vanit, it... it <sighs> I do not vet for rep representation. I, I don't vet for representation. Um, one, because it's very subjective. Like we, we will in community disagree so much on what we like or dislike about representation. Some people really never want to see a bi villain. Um, some people, if there is cheating at all in a storyline, they really don't want to read it because that's a hurtful thing. I'm okay with some of that stuff if there's nuance put on it. Mm -hmm. um personally but I like a difficult book that makes me grapple with things but not everyone's looking for that some people really want something that makes them feel really good um so I collect both and there's also the history element of that right like the way that erotica and romance uh, or like smut as you put it low would um would help us understand like bi and pan existence in queer history and in straight history seeing how we are treated in that kind of material is useful it will be useful to somebody somebody is going to go write their dissertation on like bisexuality and like the heterosexual gaze um and smut um like someone's going to do that and it's going to be useful to someone and some people are just going to read it for their own enjoyment so like i value that stuff almost just as much as the nonfiction books that I collect. Um, but yeah, I think bad representation is part of our history. Like understanding how we are failed by other people or how we fail our own community in, in literature is important, I think, to the things that I'm interested in like 
learning through the library, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, Because, I mean, we do, as a community, have a very complicated history. Like, that's something Vinit and I have been trying to work our way through a lot on this channel. Um, And, yeah, especially in, like, representation and, and literature. And I think, like you said, it's important to to say, you know, here we were represented not very well or not as the good people, but that's still a part of the history of this community. Yeah, yeah. I think an example that I think of is that uh, the, the bi serial killer trope that sort of emerged in the 80s alongside um, the AIDS crisis, um, where bi men especially, but also bi women were, you know, villainized, um, seen as vectors of disease, dangerous to both straight and gay communities. And that translated in film into portraying serial killers as having uh, bisexual tendencies or that that was part that like that's a a woven in part of um, how messed up this person is. And by having books on my shelves that have bi serial killers in them that were written during that time or written 10 years after that time, but still are drawing from that uh, cultural view of bisexuality, um, that's an illustration of our history, right? Mm -hmm. Poor representation tells us something. It's (laughs) not everyone's going to want it, but I have it. (laughs) That's... (laughs) What are some examples of books that you have with by serial killers in them? If you can think of uh, So serial killers. Off the top of my head, I won't necessarily know. Um, I know that there is several with by villains who are like dangerous. There's a, there's a book called Night Film by Marisha Pessel where the, the uh, antagonist is by. And that's why I have it on the shelf. I haven't read it yet. I, but I know that about that plot part of the plot line um that does draw on that like sense of the um the I mean it's ableist as well right like like anything that has to do with mental health and bisexuality and villainizing that is also ableist Mm -hmm. so the idea that someone is like unwell and evil and that makes them means they do this thing as well Mm-hmm. So I can't give you a ton of examples off the top of my head. I'm sorry. There's uh, 300 books back there. <laughs> so, but I I completely agree with your point. Like I was discussing some of the stuff and what I've been writing about representation and talking about some of the tropes that we see in film and TV, and then also talking about in representation the the real life representation, like um, all the articles that came out in the 80s and how that was sort of the first awareness, first like big brand in the media talking about bisexuality mm-hmm. and it was all about villainizing mainly bisexual men. Um, mm-hmm. And you've got to understand that the tropes come from somewhere, right? These tropes just aren't picked out of thin air. It's an assumption based on a, on a fact that someone created out of something. Um, yeah. So, the AIDS crisis created this, they made this villain idea of bisexual men, but then created the bisexual villain trope. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how that kind of plays into each other. So hi everyone, we're gonna cut the video there. So make sure you tune in next month for part two of our interview with Bren from the Bipan Library. Thank you and see you next month. Bye.